through. And I, I want to bring up a consistent theme in the questions. And that is, how do we come back from this? I mean, we are where we are. We can't change history. We can't change what's been done. What's, what's the road back? How do we, how the hell do we get from where we are back to even 2019, let alone towards something like what you or I might like to see, where a lot of power is returned back to the individual, lower taxes, lower regulation, that sort of thing. Like, it, given our political system is what it is, how do we even move in that direction? Yeah, all right. So the first thing that you need to do is like have an alternate plan or an alternate idea. And that's what our party's been doing. So I've been talking about the idea of Freedom Day. So we've got a fairly well-developed policy. Talk about that. There's a lot of people that don't know about that yet. So the idea of Freedom Day is that um, we've got restrictions and things like this at the moment, but yep. we set a line in the sand and we say after this date, um, and we, we've chosen December fourth, first first uh, first weekend of summer. Can, can, and, I, can I just say? Can I just say December third is a missed opportunity. December third is the anniversary of the Eureka Stockade. No, I know, I know, I know. Missed opportunity, but anyway, it's a Friday though, so it's bad. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, and yeah, uh, many people. Sorry, know that I've before, sidetracked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the idea is, is that um, you need to give people enough time to choose if they want to take. The vaccine or not and you know we acknowledge that and, and choice is two ways right some people don't want to take it some people do yep. want to take it yep. um you can't say that you support choice if a vaccine isn't available for someone right so we support yep. choice and so people will have by that time we think that everyone will have had the ability to choose whether or not they want to take the vaccine have made their choices and yep. then we open up and we we say okay well you know, you, you either take your chances with the virus or you take your chances with the vaccine. It's your choice. Um, but ultimately, we can't live like this forever. And so that's that's our that's what our plan is, basically, to try and um, set a deadline on what they're doing with the emergency powers. And they're talking about, um, you know, things returning back to normal as if, you know, some things are just going to reappear. But there's so many things now that are looking more and more permanent. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, so we have to say we're not we're not willing to accept this sort of permanent restrictions on our liberty. People need to uh, say we, we, we want to go back to the old normal. In fact, we want better protections than the old normal gave us yeah. um, because we've realised that those protections in many ways aren't, aren't working or have effect. failed have yeah. failed and and um we have to properly look at um you know what have the costs really been of what we've done um and i i think they'll become self-evident very oh they already are i, I think we hit reached the tipping point yesterday so yesterday the cult of zero COVID zero died in australia in, and boy in was i happy to see that yeah yeah. Yeah. So that was that was a big tipping point. You know, people were people had this sort of almost cult like uh, idea. You know, they had cult leaders. You know, people had masks with Brett Sutton on their mask and stuff. And you know, we can reach this donut day. And you know, <laughs> you know, like we've got these even the symbology of the donuts for this new religion that they've created. And oh, it's insane. It's insane. It's, it was totally unattainable, right? Because ultimately, um, you look at every country throughout the world. And we think that somehow we're special and we can just keep the virus out forever. And it's, it, but of course, that's not going to happen. Ultimately, no. we have to do battle with it. Um, the question is really, how do we do battle with it? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there's vaccines available. And if people want to choose that, there are other therapies that they, they're talking about as well. Um, they've got improved uh, treatment in hospitals and things like this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they said early on the plan was, you know, to, Give them a bit of time to ramp up their ICU capacity because yeah, they were expecting the it. hospital capacity. That was the argument. Yeah, the yeah. and they said that, like there was a media release from the previous health minister saying they get you know four thousand ICU beds or something nationally or so, or some you know massive number of ICU beds, mm. and yet this week they're talking about you know there's like there was fifteen people in ICU or something and were like overstretched yeah. and I'm like yeah. what what happened to all that preparation and that we were talking okay. about. 
I, I, I can, I can only contribute a rumor at this point. I'm, I'm trying behind the scenes to get some verification of this, but I haven't been able to yet. The rumor that I am hearing, and I would put it above the level of rumor, but I'm certainly not going to say it's been demonstrated yet, is two things are happening. Number one, hospital systems are struggling because of their own COVID safe requirements. It is mass, it's destroyed the efficiencies within the hospital itself. So they just cannot actually see as many patients as what they could without all those conditions in place. Secondly, I'm being told that there is an, an inordinate number of people who are taking extended sick leave or other, you know, long service leave or other things that they're owed within the hospital system in order to delay having to have vaccines themselves because their choice as an individual is that they don't necessarily want to do that. So th there is apparently a significant staffing issue. And I'm hearing that from a few different nurses, uh, some of whom are saying that they are continuing to work, but they're getting called in all the time to cover shifts and, and so forth, um, that the hospital capacity issue is actually in part a staffing shortage issue is what I'm hearing at the moment. I cannot, and I don't expect you to know uh, one way or the other. But I, I, have, I have some insight into this. Um, okay. But I don't know about, like, I'm not sure about, you know, vaccine hesitancy amongst nurses. You know, some have contacted me and said that they're not they're not happy about this or whatever. But, I mean, I think there's, there's a few factors here. One is that... Um, emergency departments are mm -hmm. overloaded. And one big reason for that is that um, many GP clinics uh, won't see people with respiratory issues because they're concerned yep. it might be COVID. Yep. And uh, so there are some like respiratory uh, specialist places that will still do that, but many people are going to emergency departments, right? Yep. So for treatment. And uh, so that's the first issue. Now, if you've got a chronic uh, respiratory issue like, um, you know, uh, uh, COPD or, or asthma yep. or, or, you know, you know, cancer or something like that, um, yep. you know, you could imagine the difficulty every time you needed to go to the doctor to get treatment. It'd be a nightmare. Uh, but, yeah, it would be a nightmare. And another issue is um, there's been a very, and they were talking about it today, um, finally, uh, a very large number of people presenting to emergency departments uh, with self-harm, um, yeah. which is uh, awful, yeah. um, including many, many children. Uh, yeah. And so emergency departments are in, like it's, 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 it's the most sickening irony that the whole yeah. rationale for the lockdowns was to stop our hospital system being overloaded and yet the restrictions themselves are causing the hospital system to be overloaded um, yeah. in different ways than what yeah. they were thinking. But, um, yeah, certainly emergency departments are suffering. Mm. Um, there's, a, I've heard lots of stories of, you know, staff not not coping very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah, it, but in the mental health sector, you know, they, they, they had this, you know, Royal Commission, they, you know, because this is a critical, critical issue at the moment, they've, they've said they're spending millions and millions and millions and millions, billions and billions of dollars on mental health. And yet my understanding is, is that the EBA negotiations with the unions are, uh, are breaking down. Um, they're not getting the staff that they need. Um, yeah. Like what's happening with all that money? Like, I mean, yeah. you know, and they, was, they were saying, and I was asking about this in estimates. I was, they were saying, oh, we're going to have a psychologist, we're going to have money for psychologists in every school. And I'm like, where are these psychologists going to come from? Like, and, you know, and you just want to just click your fingers and come up with thousands of psychologists. Like, it's not that easy. And can we just pause for a second? If your policies are creating the need to have psychologists in every school, maybe that should be a reality check about your policies. Um, there's another quote, I don't remember who, who first said this, um, but, but talking about how the government breaks your legs and then hands you a crutch and says, hey, isn't it good that we were here to give you a crutch, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and this is what's happening now. They've created these problems. I've, and, and there's a truism that I think is reasonably well accepted amongst libertarian circles, but not widely known outside of that. And that is that government programs usually achieve the opposite of what they were designed to achieve. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a, a completely unrelated example. Uh, so I used to be a John Howard fanboy, right? I grew up as a conservative and John Howard, anything that came out of his mouth, he was, he was basically, the, the, you know, he was next to Jesus, right? There was God, there was Jesus, and then there was John Howard. So when he turned around and he said, hey, 
Uh, we're we're going to help people to afford to buy their own home. Uh, and so we're going to create the first homeowner's grant, right? That's going to help people who can't save a deposit to get into their own home. And that's going to make housing more affordable. That was the intent with the policy. Yeah. Well, what happens if you understand anything about economics, it's it's a continuous dance between supply and demand, right? And that's what drives prices. If if demand is outstripping supply, prices will rise sometimes very quickly. And vice versa, if, if demand is not adequate for the amount of supply on the market, prices will drop sometimes very quickly. So when you try and fix a supply and demand imbalance, demand is too high, house prices are too high. So what we're going to do is we're going to help more people to get into the market to increase demand even further. That was his solution. Now, of course, he didn't put it in those terms, but if you actually look at it economically, that's what he did. And ultimately, what we've seen now where house prices are, are more unreachable than ever before um, was actually a direct consequence of his attempt to make housing more affordable. So that's an unrelated example. But here we're seeing another example. They were trying to protect the hospital system and save lives. And I would argue that if you look in quality of life adjusted years, we've lost more life. Than, than what would have happened had they taken a much more, uh, in my opinion, sensible approach to COVID. Uh, and the hospital capacity is now being stretched as a result of their policies. They're, they're ultimately achieving sort of the opposite of what they set out to achieve.